This talk is about <laughs> ranking one versus one games with Erwin. Um, it's a toy project which I've been working on for yeah, uh, a couple of months now, uh, in my spare time. And this is basically the first presentation of what I've been doing uh, for, for, these, uh, uh, for these two months or so. Um, the the, the, the outside is to uh, rank 1v1 games, which is basically games like chess, like Go, uh, Word Feud, uh, Starcraft duels, Quake Light duels, stuff like that. All these kinds of games are one player plays against another player, and we want to rank them. So ranking here means that we want to try a belief, and that belief is what is the skill of this player. And we want to do it based on historical data. So basically, we want to look back in time and predict how good this player or bad this player is in the future. That's the essential idea. We want to use it for two things, uh, basically. We want to use it for figuring out what player is the best player uh, for some odd measure of that. And we want to use it for matchmaking. Basically, basically, we want to find good matches. We want to find an opponent that is equally skilled as the opponent we have right here, such that we get a good match. That's another important thing, because it's not funny just to get beaten all the time. Right? Um, we are going to use one very simple measure. We're not going to look at games, we're not going to look inside the game and for Star Trek game looks at actions per minute and stuff like that. We're basically going to say, did he win, did he tie, or did he lose? Um, there is a common rating system called ELO, um, and ELO is a pretty simple system. It was made by a Hungarian, um, and you can see, see that ELO is used for a lot of this ranking. It was the basic ranking system for chess and still is. Uh, it's used by many games, so when people create games, they usually employ an ELO rating system. Uh, the way it works is basically that you you put in a rating for these players to so say, let's see if it works. That would be interesting. So now we will see. So basically, if you have a thing here, you have a player <laughs> here, right? Um, he might have a 1500 rating, and this player up here, he might have uh, some more ratings. This is B, this is A. Um, now, what you're looking at is that if, if B wins or A, that's more or less the thing we expect because B has a higher rating than A, has a much higher rating than A. So what we'll do is we'll move B up a little in rating and we'll let A lose a little bit of rating for them. Then that's the new rating, right? If it's the opposite way, so the player we expected to lose suddenly wins, we'll move him, but we'll move him further up. We'll actually move him up by five feet and this one will be moved by, down by a pretty large bit again because now we are upsetting the system. Um, ELO has a, a specific weakness which is, or not weakness, it's made for being easy to calculate by hand. So one of the simplifications of the system is that you assume that for each of these players there is no distribution around the two players. Um, which basically says that we think this, the, the rating of the players here, but it might actually be here just with a smaller probability. That's the basic idea. So this is kind of, kind of the weakness of, of <coughs> ELO. If we have a player A that has 32 matches played and a player B that has 157 matches played, should we have the same belief in these two players? No. The confidence in the B player should be much higher because we have many more games for that player, so we know more about him. Um, another thing is, if player A plays regularly, B plays rarely, or just came back from, say, a four months hiatus where he wasn't there, should they have the same rating? Probably not. We don't have as much confidence in player B. And then the final thing is that player A might consistently be beating players above his rating, which means that player is now setting up the system. He's basically fooling or cheating our rating system, and that might also be a problem. Um, so Glim2 is a, an alternative rating system made by a guy named uh, Mark E. Glickman. Um, and this system tries to cope with some of the problems of ELO, essentially. And what it does is that it tracks not one but three values for each player. So it tracks R, which is the current rating of the player. It tracks a variance named RD. And it tracks a volatility measure 
Um, so, so the RD rating is essentially the idea that uh, here the variance is fixed. But what you might want is if you know something about a player, you might actually know that his variance is like this because you have a much larger confidence in that you've got the right kind of rating. On the other hand, you might have a player where the variance is like this because you have very little confidence in that particular player. So we tried that as well. And then we tried this volatility measure, which is a measure that uh, basically measures how much this player is fooling the system or tricking the, the, the system. If he's cons consistently beating players above his skill, he's probably not right. So we have to move him. And this uh, volatility measure, sigma, makes the system able to cope with a fast changing player. A player that improves more quickly than what the system can, can actually work with. So I said most of this. Um, we have a player, we report him as the interval, not his rating, but the, an interval rounded based on this variance we have. <coughs> we uh, start players out at some very standard values and, and we have a 95 percent confidence rating in, in the range and that range means that a new player will have somewhere between 800 and 2200 points but we do not know where. And then as it goes play games we should hopefully see that uh, his rating gets adjusted to a right value and his variance, the variance of that player will go down because he's playing games. And that's the essential idea. And then if he is fooling the system we will increase the sigma value a bit meaning that in the next rating uh, he'll, he'll be moved further than he would normally be moved. And this is the basic idea of, of, of this uh, legal system made by Glickman. So Quake Live is this modern update of a Quake 3 engine. Um, it's a game of quite high skill. Um, there's a high ceiling, so from the worst player to the best player, there's very, very far, uh, perhaps as far as in chess. Uh, the game can best be described as chess plus hand-eye coordination in the sense that you have to have a, you have to react quickly, you have to have good coordination. But there's a lot of things which are not about uh, this thing. For instance, your decision making, your position on uh, levels, uh, what items you pick up, what weapons you pick up, weapons respawn at a certain time in the game, so you have to be back there and pick them up again. So there's a lot of things where you have to keep track in your head of the timing things in this. Uh, the game has many, many Polish players actually. It's the third biggest nation of Quake players. Um, which is quite, quite fitting being here and then talking about it, I think. Um, so the thing I do is I start by saying implementing this legal tool system is rather easy. It's, a, it's well described, it's fully functional. It has seven steps. There is a calculation example, so for each step you can verify that you got the right value. But funnily enough, there is a non-converging loop in the original thing <coughs> from the 22nd uh, of February. And the reason is that, that Glickman used a neutral Rapson um, conversion scheme there and it never converges for some input values. And my thought is if you had used QuickChip in that and just put in random inputs, you would have found that. Uh, I tried yesterday for fun, and it finds it around 800,000 test cases, something like that. Then it goes into an infinity loop. Um, the data is public in the sense that you can get data from matches from these Quake games on the web, but they are in an HTTP thing, and it's uh, you, you have to dig them out. So what you do is you write a scraper, and you write the scraper based on regular expressions, the standard HTTPC client inside Erlang and JSX because a lot of these data are in JSON encoded format, so you just decode them. And you let Prospect provide the stable storage because you'll never grow this database above 10 gigabytes. So it doesn't matter to use storage that are bigger. Uh, and Postgres is just fine for this. And the idea is that we refresh player every five days. That gives us a new set of matches that they have played. And then we uh, fetch, fetch these matches and then we analyze these matches. It's, it's basic scraping, scraping, scraping. Um, the system does not care if we suddenly uh, decide to spawn like 3,000 uh, get requests at Ferrari, but we'll see how we fix that later on. Basically, if there's 3,000 matches to be fetched, 
We are spawning 3,000 processes and each process will fetch one match. That's how it works. The database is built such that it is item potent, so we can basically overwrite things without uh, changing stuff. And that means we can restart the system at any point, which is a nice feature. Um, then we use the jobs <coughs> by Wolfweaver. So this is a jobs definition. What it says is that I have a bucket, um, and the bucket has a size of 300 elements in it. Furthermore, you are only allowed to leave 300 seconds in that bucket. So the first part there, the max time, max size, tells us exactly how, how full our bucket may get. The second part, the regulator section, defines <coughs> the limits in this bucket. So we define two limits. We say, you're never allowed to execute from this bucket, you're never allowed to execute more than two things concurrently. So that's the counter limit. And the second limit is that we make a hole in the bottom of the bucket, so we have a dripping, leaky bucket algorithm, and we say the rate limit by which we'll execute things out of the bucket is one per second. Because the quick life cycle cannot cope with me coming with 3,000 processes, although I can easily do it in Erlang. Uh, they're running some PHP stuff, or Node.js stuff, I don't know. It doesn't work. So, to, to fix that, you're doing this. You are putting in, you say, spawn a lot of processes, just keep this bucket filled, refill it every minute, and then let these uh, regulators control the actual outflow from the bucket. And that's a really, really neat um, idiom in Erlang, that you can just spawn things off, and then the, let this uh, limiter actually limit you down to the level you want. And this is a dynamically confi configurable thing, which is, which is pretty nice. So this is the code that we use in each fetcher. Uh, what it says is, ask jobs on the queue fetch queue may be run, and if we get a no, we will just stop, because the item potency and stop means that we'll got just get this job reviewed again later. Um, the other part is, if that goes through, we ask the overload system, which I'll describe in the next slide, if we're allowed to run actually. And if we get a yes, we fetch and stop, the thing. If we get a no, we just stop. So, the OLO thing is because they tend to be overloaded. Uh, so to fix that, I have a two-state final state machine in it that can basically be them operating overloaded. And when we see slow latencies at that side, we basically move to a state where we are not doing anything for either 5 or 15 minutes. So this is kind of a, be nice to the guys and do, do not get uh, plugged into the firewall at some point. Right? Um, so, the basic thing here is that the phase code is not at all caring about limitation. We let jobs care about limitation. We, we outsource this choice to jobs. And then we push everything into the same queue. So, it doesn't matter what kind of thing we want to fetch off the pitch. It's still the same queue that is going to be used for that. Um, we basically just make sure that the queue is filled once in a while such that there's always the job to track to do it. And in order to ensure, ensure that we're not losing a job and we do not know about it, we put everything on a simple one for one supervisor and we send that to the crash log if something, if something goes wrong in there. And that's basically how that works. Um, we ran tournaments. Tournaments is a one, one week of matches. Uh, we construct what I call the battle graph. So the battle graph is basically that you have a vertex for each player, and then you make A. So say you have a player here, and a player there, and if A is B and B, you have an edge between, from A to B. That's essentially how it works. And then it means that I can easily go in and ask what games did this player play, and what kind of, yeah, stuff did we get out of that. Um, it's, it's, it's basically just so we can ask uh, what matches did did this player win? What matches did, did this player lose? And that together, who did he lose to? Because we need to know the, the, the player he lost to in order to get his rating out of the database and stuff like that. Ranking here is limited by jobs as well. So we just spawn a lot of ranking processes, each get a chunk of 4,000 matches. And then we just tell jobs, oh, but you are only allowed to run four of those uh, at the same time. So there is, it's still parallel, but we have a limit on it. Um, and we can just up that number if we go to a large machine, machine with, uh, with more cores, right? So basically, jobs here and the parallelism as well. 
So the current performance limit is not the urine, it's the database. Uh, because fetching out data is actually too slow. Uh, and that's totally uh, on my part because I'm doing it the wrong way. Uh, I should load everything into memory and then do memories rather than loading it from disk. So there's a factor of thousands win there, I think. Uh, there's no hype at all, so we have no native code execution. Um, and furthermore, this G2 thing is an obvious candidate for, for that because it's floating point operations all the way and high is efficient on floating point operations. Um, so currently we are, given two cores, we rank a one-way tournament in around 30 seconds. And I want to get that down, there's a reason for that. Um, because this is, right now it looks like I'm only running this at the end of every week and 30 seconds is nothing there. But there's a point. Um, results are plotted with ggplot. Um, ggplot works like a painless layer model, so basically you say I want to plot and then you layer stuff on top of that plot. So basically it's just painting stuff on top of the, of the, the plot you already made. So these pluses here are actually sums of different structures I'm layering on top of the basic plot. Um, let me show you how it looks when one does it. So I hope I hope it'll actually show it. Pretty nice. Oh, it won't. But there's pretty many places. Perhaps I can. Let's see. Yeah. I can zoom. So what it plots here is players. Where you have over here, you have the, <coughs> over here you have the, the, the name of the player, and here you have their, their current rating. Uh, the dot in the middle here, the, the blue dot, is the current rating of him. The interval here is the variance, and I'm actually ranking them based on a conservative estimate. So I take the low point of their variance and say that is their current rating. Um, and this is for like four four weeks of, of data gathering, and basically all the good players are in the top 50 which is pretty good uh, for four weeks of reading. So it's, it's, it, be, it begins to get accurate at the moment. Uh, over time, the good players will get even further out and get more points. So it, 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 looks, it looks pretty nice. Um, there is a measure down here. Let me see if I can find it. There's this measure of volatility, which is colored in this, uh, in this plot. So the volatile players are colored more red. And let's see if we can find one. There must be one. Uh, this guy here, for instance, um, is a Spanish player, and he is better than what, where he is currently, but he has a very low variance, so normally he would, have, he would have to play a lot of matches in order to improve and get on in rating. But because the system has figured out that this player is actually fooling the system, we give him a higher volatility, so he'll move further off. He'll have an opportunity to actually get further off in rating quicker. And that means that the system is, is faster at, uh, at getting good prediction for players. Um, yeah, I have this one as well, which I probably is going to show you, which is the uh, is a plot of rating versus the volatility. So what you have is that most players are down here with a very low volatility, so they are more or less where we expect them to be or moving around slowly. And then you have few players here, which these are a single player that accounts for these even though there's 200 out here. And basically those are the players on the move in the system, players fooling the system currently. So, the idea is that, that uh, so, so what I'm going to do from, from here on out, because this is more or less where I am, is that I need to do stuff with jobs, because jobs need maturity. There's a lot of things in jobs that are nasty. Uh, dampness and samples doesn't work correctly at the moment. Uh, and I have found some nasty <coughs> corner pieces in it. On the other hand, I think it's the right way to go. I think having such a scheduler framework like jobs where you just throw out the specification and get an answer, or, or use that specification and outsource all of the scheduling thing, is very important. I and mean, it is very, very important when you're talking about web servers that has to cope with inbound node. So this is a classic problem, and I, I think that the Node.js guys will get something in a couple of months or years where they'll realize that this is actually important. The way by which you, you schedule stuff in your system is important to getting good latencies. Um, 
there's there's a lot of things there. You cannot just queue everything in FIFA order, for instance. You have to sometimes do it in leaf order and then say, okay, those that were down in the bottom of the stack, sorry, they're just going to be lost. But all the others we can give a good experience. Whereas if you do it in the FIFA order, you might actually end up giving everybody a bad experience. Stuff like that. So I'm planning on doing things with jobs and trying to add stuff to that and improve it. So that's the first part. And the second part is that I'm not detecting banned players. I should. Um, then I want to tune the rating system um, because uh, the, there's this initial sigma value which can be tuned. You can choose it. And there's a tau value which is a measure of how much the sigma value will change. You can tune that as well. And nobody really knows the optimal values for quick life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three months of games use two and a half months to train the system with a specific sigma and tau and then use the last half month as a predictor and see how good the system is at predicting. And I think I'm also going to do the how much better than yellow am I with the system at that point. Um, and then the plan is to run simulated and kneeling on it in order to get, which is that mm -hmm. an optimization algorithm uh, using randomness. To get really to, to get some good values, it doesn't have to be the optimal ones. It just has to be good values. Um, and in order to do that, I need to be able to rank these players at a very fast rate. And that is the reason why I'm so worried about performance in this, and I want want to make it faster. Of course, I envision I have to run like thirty thousand simulated and even ones to get a good answer, and that means that if I should be able to do it in a night or something. Um, then I need uh, then I need that time down. Of course, it parallelizes because it's embarrassingly parallel, but still I need to do that. Um, and right now I have around one hundred twenty five thousand matches scanned, um, and it's about five thousand matches a day that comes in. So I have a very good data set. Um, and the plan is in three months I'll have half a million or something like that, and then then I'll just see what happens. And that's about it. So, questions? And plans and uh, taking this to uh, more than one versus one game? So, like, uh, so, that's a really, really good question. The question is does this work in team games? Yeah. And the answer is no. <laughs> Okay. It doesn't work in team games. Uh, if you want to do it on team games, you need other rating systems. There's one by Microsoft named TrueSkill, which they use in Xbox Live. And that is clever. And the way you do it is basically that every player pulls a little bit of his rating into a pool for the team. And then you steal, the winner's team steals a bit from the loser's team's pool. And then you redistribute. Uh, the pool back to the players, but based on the performance they had in this game. So yeah. that means that the losing player's team can actually have a player that gains rate. How did you handle uh, uh, this algorithm being not converted in two cases? <coughs> so there was originally a new Rapson uh, group finder in that war, <coughs> searcher for a uh, value in, in, in the code. And the problem is that that algorithm, the particular algorithm used there, might not for some inputs, but Mark Lipman made a change to the algorithm or to the system right now, so it uses an Illinois-based bracketing algorithm, and that will always converge. And I know it will always converge because I have eight million quick check runs that shows that it always converges. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably going to always converge. And it also the interesting thing here is that even though I cannot check correctness of the output, so I can still, there is a loop in there, I can still check for termination, and that's a minimum thing I could check for. Um, also, some of the parts in, in, in this clip rating system are actually uh, isomorphic, so there's a scale down and scale up operation. If you chain those together, it should be the identity. So there you have the first property of the system right away. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's, that's the way you make sure that it always converges. Uh, you implement a better algorithm and you, then you just throw a quick check at it until you are satisfied. And again, I love. Uh -huh. So, um, I was thinking, um, because you do this thing like kind of offline, right. of the games, right. uh, 
So I think the real benefit could be to use it for online matchmaking. Right. Because also because of the platform of the airline, because it might be done real fast. You know, right. because the wait times for the other games are I like around a minute to find the match, and it's quite Indeed. quite a big amount of time. Really. Indeed. So um, have you maybe thought about it? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Uh, I think that it would be a really good thing to use it for, for matchmaking as well. Um, and I think I would go for a heuristic where you're looking, digging into it with a heuristic and then also you could tune that. A feedback loop into it so matchmaking system could influence the offline uh, rating system. That's always, always a possibility, yes. Yeah. It is. Uh, it wasn't in the scope in the beginning, but it can very well become into the scope in of being into the scope over time. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, is it a commercial code base, or are you going to uh, somehow open source it? Um, right now, so 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 I plan on open sourcing the Glico calculator. Um, the other code, I'm a bit more hesitant to open source because it's very easy to use that code to destroy all of quicklife.com. <laughs> it's very easy. You just have to order some numbers, right? Um, and I'm afraid that people are not really, not really know what they're doing here because I think a lot of people want these data for some kind of, of knowledge. So um, that's the reason for why I'm a bit hesitant about uh, open sourcing that part, that particular part. But but a lot of the other parts, like the parallel rank and stuff like that, sure. It's just open source that at the point.